13.2 about the church covers church attributes, and we take this language from Scripture, but <clears throat> the language specifically, verbatim, for the most part, comes from the Nicene Creed. Let me actually put that on the screen real quick. We haven't looked at the Nicene Creed um, since uh, chapter 4, the doctrine of the Trinity, where we looked at the ecumenical creeds, noticing their Trinitarian structure. The Nicene Creed, just like the other creeds, you know, has an article about the Father, about the Son, and about the Spirit. And let's look at what the Nicene Creed says about the Spirit. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Did you notice that? One holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. Well, that's what we're going to say describes the church according to the New Testament. So let's go through these one at a time, and we also add that it is enduring based off of Matthew 16. All right, so first, what does it mean that the church is one? Well, it, it means united in spite of visible divisions, right? So like the United States has visible divisions, right? There are 50 states. We live in California here, but the, the country is one. There's one country, right? So the church has visible divisions, this church, that church, my church, your church, this congregation, that congregation, and disagreements too. But that's the way we see it, visibly. The way God sees it, invisibly, is just as one church, right? One Lord, we all share the same faith and the same Lord, and that makes us part of the same church, right? So there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who's over all and through all and in all, right? So the church is one, one body of Christ, not multiple, one temple of God, not multiple, and so on. The church is one, meaning it is united in spite of visible divisions. God sees it as one. All right, the church is holy. What does it mean that the church is holy? Um, and I kind of, this is sort of playful. Um, that, have you ever heard, you know, why would I go to church? A bunch of hypocrites there. And th th there's a sense in which, yeah, the church does have sinners, just like the world has sinners, right? Um, people say that the divorce rates within the church are just as high as the divorce rates outside of the church. I don't know where the statistics are right now currently, but if there's still something like that, then that is sad. But does that mean the church is full of hypocrites? I would argue no, but let's look at it. It says this, the church is not full of hypocrites. There's always room for more. <laughs> Come join us, fellow hypocrite, if you, if you think being a hypocrite means being a sinner, right? But the church is not full of hypocrites. The church is full of sinners who know they're sinners. We say we're sinners. If we say we aren't sinners, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us, right? So we're forgiven sinners. And that's part of what makes the church holy, right? It is not a claim about personal virtue. It is not a claim about personal morality. We are sinners in need of forgiveness, and we know we've found it in the church, Christ church, where he delivers his forgiving word and washing and meal, right? Um, but what about all the scandals? What about all the betrayals of trust? Those happen, and they're sad, and we should grieve, grieve them, mourn them, and we should take all precautionary steps to prevent them, minimize them. We should select trustworthy leadership in the church and hold that leadership regularly accountable to avoid scandals and betrayals of trust. But the church is holy, and that's not my words, that's the word of God. Look again at Ephesians 5, which we read earlier, that he might sanctify her, his church, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. So Christ is a holy groom and he has a holy bride, his church. He sees to it. He's already washed her in baptism. And when he presents her to himself on that last day, she will be holy and without blemish. So the church is holy from God's perspective. It's full of forgiven sinners. We've been clothed with the righteousness of Christ. Faith in Christ is counted as righteousness. Galatians 3, Paul says, as many of you as been baptized have been clothed with Christ, have put on Christ. The church is Catholic, one holy Catholic church. All right, now this is similar to one, but not identical. When we said the church is one, we were saying the church is united in spite of visible divisions. When we say the church is Catholic, 
we're saying it is united in spite of visible diversity. Now, Catholic with a capital C generally refers to the denomination, the Roman Catholic Church. But Catholic with a lowercase c is an English word. It means universal. It's the universality of the church. It includes peoples from all nations, people who speak all kinds of different languages. A good verse for this comes from Ephesians 5, or Revelations 5. In Revelation 5, John is having this throne room vision, and part of what he sees is um, not only the four creatures surrounding the throne singing praises to God, not only the 24 elders, not only the Lamb, Christ, who comes and takes the scroll out of the Father's hand, but then all the saints. And the elders who join in in this song, they sing a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God, people from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. So when we say the church is Catholic, we're saying it is united in spite of visible diversity diversity of tribe, language, people, nation. And the church is Catholic. We have brothers and sisters on basically every continent, people who believe in Jesus. So one, united in spite of visible division, right? Um, holy, clothed with Christ's righteousness through faith in him. Catholic, united in spite of visible diversity, people of every nation, language, and so on. One holy Catholic and apostolic church. What do we mean when we say the church is apostolic? We mean that the things taught by the apostles are still being taught today. What Jesus taught the apostles, what he sent them out to teach, what they did teach, what we have recorded in the New Testament of their teachings, that's what the church still teaches. The same faith that Jude says was once and for all delivered to the saints. The apostolic faith, that's our faith. Right? The apostolic scriptures are still the only infallible source of doctrine. The church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Let's look at a couple passages that say that. The early church in Jerusalem devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and prayers. And the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, Ephesians 2.20. Now, there are some churches that claim to be the apostolic church, and it's a different claim. They don't simply mean that they teach what the apostles taught, that their only source of infallible doctrine is the apostolic scriptures, the New Testament. They mean their church is like founded historically by one of the apostles. Like Rome claims that their church is founded by Peter, the first pope, right? The Orthodox will claim, or at least the Egyptian Orthodox do, I don't know if they all do. Um, that their church is founded by St. Mark historically, right? And that's what they mean by like, they're the apostolic church. That a lot of churches make this claim in an exclusive way. Like we're the one true church, come back to mother church. Uh, the Roman Catholics certainly say this. Um, the Orthodox say it in their own way. Other churches say it in their own way too. Um, Lutherans believe that wherever the word of God is being taught, wherever the prophetic word of the Old Testament, the apostolic word of the New Testament is being taught, you will have believers there and that is the church, the one holy Catholic and apostolic church of God. Um, and we also have that the church is enduring. We get this from Matthew 16, when Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell, Hades is better, um, the gates of Hades um, shall not prevail against it. So not only will Jesus build his church, but Hades, death, is not going to prevail against it. It's going to endure. There will always be Christians on earth. There's not going to be any scenario where there aren't any Christians left on the earth. Between now and when Christ returns, there will always be some remnant of believers. No matter how severe the persecution, no matter how awful the times, there will be Christians. Witnessing, says the book of Revelation, to Christ publicly. The true church will remain until Jesus returns. Maybe this congregation will die or that denomination will split, but the gates of Hades won't overcome Christ's church. So these are the attributes of church, one holy Catholic and apostolic church that endures to the end till Christ's return.